Well, good morning. How in the world did you get up this early? This is just not right. You have to come get up an hour earlier than you usually have to. But you made it. I'm glad that you're here. This morning, I'm going to take a little detour. Uh, we spend a lot of time in the Gospel of John, and every now and then a pastor needs to get just a different kind of sermon out of his system. And so we're going to do something different this morning. I want to invite you to turn with me to Matthew chapter 6. And I'm going to build upon something that I shared with you last week. Last week we talked about how uh, there was a glory that will come to every one of us on the other side because of Jesus. Uh, that's something that we're, all, all, we're going to all have in common. But at the same time that there is a different glory that each one of us will be able to have. And I talked about how important it was for you to lay up for yourselves treasure in heaven. But I didn't tell you what was involved with that. So this morning I'm going to do that. I'm going to share with you what Jesus says about laying up for yourself treasure in heaven. If you, if you wanted to take this the right way, you could say, well, what the pastor is about to tell me is how I can be rich. Because the truth is the wealth that you have laid up on the other side is true wealth. And everything that you have here that you leave behind is going to go away. You're going to lose it all. And so this is how to have certainly riches that will not fade, will not go away. Uh, if this is your first time visiting with us, or maybe it's your first time maybe in 10 years, you say, every time I go to church, the pastor talks about money. Well, uh, you just happen to hit it on the right day. And... Uh, this isn't usually the way it goes here, but this is the way it's going to go today. But instead of how to be rich, I'm going to give you the title of the message is Faith, Finances, and then I'm going to build upon that and talk about even the future. And so let me read the text, and then I'll make a few comments on it. Then I'm going to start to go through many different passages that I'm just going to read to you and allow you to listen and that we'll discuss, and I'll give you five thoughts about how to lay up for yourself treasure in heaven. Here's what the Bible says, Matthew chapter 6, verse 19. Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moth and rust destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. But store up for yourselves treasures in heaven, where neither moth nor rust destroys, and where thieves do not break in or steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Now, before I get into the five thoughts I'm going to give you about how to lay up for yourself treasure in heaven, I'm going to give you just three basic foundational things that you see within this text uh, that may seem obvious, but we don't want to overlook them. Uh, Jesus is speaking. He's preaching in this text through the Sermon on the Mount, the greatest sermon that's ever been preached by any preacher, and certainly the Son of God knows how to deliver a message. And he's talking about the importance of thinking about the life to come and planning and preparing for that life. Most of us keep our minds on the here and now, and we don't think a lot about the future. But if we're wise, we would think more about that day than this day, because that day is going to last an awfully long time. So notice what Jesus says. Don't store up for yourselves treasures on earth, but store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. So what I'm about to tell you is not something that you need to do for God. God has no needs. God doesn't need anything. Uh, God doesn't need you and he doesn't need me. Certainly the one that can speak the universe into existence is doing fine without us. This is not something I'm about to tell you to do because God needs it. This is something for you. Jesus says it is for yourselves. It is not for God's sake. It is for your sake. Uh, the other thing I want you to see is that it is where you put the treasure. It's not here on earth, but you're laying it up in heaven. And so you're looking to store something in a place where you've never been, uh, to have a bank account, as it were, or a vault, or a, a, a treasure room in heaven where we're going one day, but it's not going to be here and now. So you, the, the, the wealth and the things that you have here have to be transferred to another place, and there's a way to do that, and that's what we're talking about. But heaven is our home. This is not our home. 
Uh, we are not going to be here but a short amount of time. 80, 90 years maybe for those that live a long life, some maybe even 100. That may seem like a long time, but in the light of eternity, where it will be time without end, 100 years is going to seem like that, like a vapor. It's whew, You breathe, you go out on a cold morning, you see your breath, and then all of a sudden it's gone. That's how quick life is. It's like a vapor, the Bible says. And so heaven is our home. This is not our home. We need to be thinking about that life and the next life, not about this life. And so the other thing I want you to see, because, of course, this life is short, uh, the last thing I want you to see here is verse 21, where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Uh, If you've got wealth, you think about it. If you've got a lot of money saved up for retirement, you think about it. If you've got grandkids, you're going to show me pictures of those grandkids because that's your treasure, and you're always thinking about them. And I know how you, not that you're thinking about them because you talk about them. That's okay. That's a good thing. Uh, where your treasure is, though, that's where your heart's going to be. And if everything that you have is here on this earth, all you're going to be thinking about is what you have and how to take care of it and how to maintain it. But if everything is being moved to the other side, then you're not thinking so much about this life, but you're longing for heaven. You're looking forward to going. Uh, you're, you're ready you're to leave because you know that you've been wise in the way that you've handled your business on this side because there's something waiting for you on the other side. You may say, well, I don't know what it is. That's all right. None of us know. We haven't been there yet, but we know it's going to be better. So with that in mind, heaven's coming. This is for you, not for God. And your heart is going to be where your treasure is, so your treasure needs to be in heaven. So with that in mind, uh, I guess one more foundational thing I do not want to skip over, and it's maybe the most important thing that I'm going to say today, which is you cannot do anything I'm about to tell you unless you have a relationship with Jesus. Apart from Jesus Christ, there is no heaven for you, so there is no way to lay up for yourself treasure in heaven. Our sin separates us from God, and Jesus is the Son of God. His mission in coming to this earth was to die a death on a cross, to take our place and to pay for our sin, so that we who are not fit for heaven can be made fit for heaven. We who do not have a relationship with God can have a relationship with God. We can, by faith, turn to Jesus, call upon his name, ask him to save us, and be born again into the family of God Uh, believing that he died for our sin and rose again from the grave is the means by which we are prepared for heaven. But apart from Jesus, there is no heaven. And so everything that I'm about to say is not going to help you until you turn by faith to Jesus and receive him as the Lord of your life. So with that in mind, let me give you five thoughts about how to lay up for yourself treasure in heaven. Here's the first one. A lot of it has to do with your heart. Uh, The Bible says in 2 Corinthians 9, 7, each one must do just as he has purposed in his heart, not grudgingly or under compulsion. For God loves a cheerful giver. If you're going to lay up for yourself treasure in heaven, one of the things God's going to examine is not just that you gave and what you gave, but he wants to know how and why you gave it. Did you give it because you felt like you had to, but you really didn't want to? The motive behind why you give matters. And and part of the judgment or the evaluation that God makes on judgment day is not just what you gave and that you gave, but it's how you gave. Were you happy that you gave? Were you excited that you could show honor and glory to the King of Kings that we just spent so long singing about? Are you excited because you're part of God's family and God has given you an opportunity to give to lay up for yourself treasure in heaven? Are you thinking about how God's going to take what you give and use it for his name and his kingdom's sake and that God is doing something great and he's allowing you Someone who was on your way to hell, someone who was going to be in a place where the devil's going to go, and he's rescued you out of that and brought you into his family and washed away your sin, and and now he's going to let you, on top of all of that, be part of his great movement to rescue the world. This is exciting. It's a great thing. It's exciting stuff. And and everybody should want to be a part of that, but some people, they give, but boy, they don't want to. That offering plate comes by and they just kind of, they look like they're sucking on lemons. I mean, it's just, my goodness. Is, is, we got to do this every time we get here? You're not supposed to do it grudgingly or under compulsion. The Bible says God loves 
loves a cheerful giver. So the first thing you want to do is examine your heart when you're giving. Why are you giving it? Are you excited about giving? Do you like giving? Or do you not like it? Because you think what you're giving is yours. We'll get to that in a minute. Number two, it's not just about your heart, but some of the reward you can lay up for heaven is based on your deeds. Now, giving is a deed, but there's more to the reward system that God has, and some of it, it has to do with the things that you do. Uh, the Bible says this, the Son of Man is going to come in his glory. This is Matthew 16, 27. It co- going to come in the glory of his Father with his angels and will then repay every man according to his deeds. And so God is going to not allow you to work without rewarding you for it. How would you like to go to work on your job here in this life, and you work every week or two weeks, you're supposed to get a paycheck, and at the end of the two weeks, uh, your boss or your employer stiffs you, doesn't pay you. Now, now you would probably feel a little bit bitter, a little bit upset, nasty. You may want to sue, go to court. I mean, there's all sorts of things that may go through your mind. But you were owed something that you didn't receive. Now, here's the difference. We owe God everything. It's not that he owes us. God does not have to reward us, but he does. He chooses to. In other words, God gives you an incentive. We should want to love and serve and work for God, even if he didn't do anything for us. But the fact that God comes along on top of of saving our souls and says, now I'm giving you an opportunity to invest your time and your energy and your resources in such a way that on the other side, your deeds will have earned you a reward. Well, that's just a cherry on top, isn't it? That's, that, that, that's a wonderful thing. Now listen, God does not reward your good intentions. Uh, the things that you thought about doing and didn't do. The fact that it was in your heart and you didn't act on it is not going to get you anything. It's not your thoughts, what you thought about doing, it's what you actually did. God rewards your deeds. And so the question that would come up would be, how am I serving Jesus? How how am I giving of my life and my time in such a way that Jesus is honored, his name is shared, and the kingdom of God is served, and I can look for a reward on that day? That's something to think about. So our rewards are based on our heart. We want to do it cheerfully, based on our actions, what we do. And one of the actions that we uh, do is that we give. And so let me talk to you for a minute about giving, because here's what Jesus says. He uh, spoke to a, a rich man at one point, and he said to him, if you wish to be complete, go sell your possessions, give to the poor, and you will have treasure in heaven, and come follow me. Now the evidence that the man would have believed in Jesus and followed him as Lord is that he would have obeyed everything Jesus said. But the man didn't believe. He loved his money. He didn't love Jesus, and so he didn't do this. Instead of him trading his treasure on earth for treasure in heaven, he decided to keep what he thought was his, and he died without Christ, and now he's lost everything. And Jesus made that offer, and the man turned him down. But the offer that he made is an offer that's true for all of us. When you give you receive a reward for it. That's what Jesus was saying in that verse. If you sell what you have, you give that, you get treasure in heaven. Now, I want to talk to you for a minute about how you give because, again, uh, there's nuance to this. I think there is anyway. I, I, I think that it matters not just that you give, but the way you give and how you give and what you give. And so let me share a few things on top of this with you. Uh, one is that when you give, you ought to give In Jesus' name. Let me show you what I mean by that. Matthew chapter 10, Jesus says, Whoever in the name of a disciple gives to one of these little ones even a cup of cold water to drink, truly I say to you, he shall not lose his reward. And so we give a cup of cold water, but that's just a small thing. You have to say, well, that's not that big of a deal. Here's, Here's the big idea. God is watching everything you do. God's keeping a record. It's not like the smallest little thing that you do is going to go to waste or be missed. 
And on judgment day, even a cup of cold water is going to have mattered. But we give a cup of cold water, but we do it in Jesus' name. In other words, I, I don't know that everything that I can give away or give to is something that God's going to reward. I graduated from Francis Marion University. I got an economics degree. I'm an alumni of that uh, school. Every now and then, they will, would love for me to send them money. I gave them plenty of money while I went there. I'm not giving them anymore. But <laughs> while I was going there, one of the things I figured out was that this school does not love Jesus, and it takes young people and brings them in and indoctrinates them to a liberal ideology, and they try to turn them in their philosophy and their religious classes away from Jesus Christ and the Bible to some kind of humanistic philosophy and theology. I don't think that it would be wise for me to give money to a place like that. I think it would be wiser to give money to something else. And so I think that when we are looking at what we could give money to and what we should not give money to, we should evaluate and think about these things. Uh, there are a lot of good organizations that do a lot of good things, but they don't share the gospel. So I, I want to see people get saved. I, I'd like to see people get cured of cancer, but if you cure somebody of cancer and then they die and go to hell, all you've done is prolong the inevitable. I would like to help someone medically and share the gospel. I would like to help someone be fed that's hungry and hear the gospel. I want someone to be clothed, but also to hear the gospel. It, it needs to be both and, not either or. And, and so you, you need to think along these lines because you can give money to something that may seem like it's good, but it's not of God. And, and, and just because you give the money away, I don't know that there will be a reward. Maybe there will be. I don't know. But I think you ought to think through what you give to and why you give to these things. And certainly I think that biblically we are taught you start with the local church. In fact, when I walk by a little red bucket at Christmas time and somebody's ringing a bell trying to get me to drop money in, I don't do that. Because when I give to my local church, I know that through the local church, it's going to do the same thing that that red bucket's doing, and I can know that I, I'm more confident in the way that I'm giving through my local church than I am dropping it in that bucket. So I try to think through these things and how you give. You want to give in Jesus name do it for his sake his name and his kingdom also you want to give sacrificially uh, here's something that Jesus was doing one time it says he sat down opposite the treasury and he began observing this is Matthew 12 how the people were putting money into the treasury and how rich people how many rich people were putting in large sums a poor widow came and he put she put in two small copper coins uh, which would amount to about a cent Calling his disciples to him, to him, he said to them, Truly I say to you, this poor widow put in more than all the cont contributors to the treasury. For they all put in out of their surplus, but she out of her poverty put in all she owned, all she had to live on. Now, now get the picture here. Back in those days, you didn't have plates that came up and down the aisle you had a bucket or a big pot or something like that, and people, as they came in, they dropped their money in. <laughs> and, and here's what Jesus is doing. He's standing by the bucket. <laughs> He's why. I mean, can you imagine, take, down, take the offer and come down the aisle to play, and Jesus is why. Mm-hmm, I see what you gave. Mm-hmm, you get. uh-huh, I see what you gave. So he's always he looks and sees whatever. By the way, this is true even today. What you gave, God saw everything you gave. Every cent. And he looked, he said, there's a lot of rich people dropping money in the bucket. But a lady drops two little coins in and he has a spell. Y'all, come here, look. Did y'all see what she just did? That was awesome, wasn't it? Well, Jesus, just two pennies. What's the big deal? Two pennies, are you kidding me? She gave everything she had. Two pennies may not be a lot, but if it's all you got, it's a whole lot. They gave out of their abundance. They gave what was left over. She gave out of her poverty and gave everything she had. A whole lot of people gave a lot of money. It didn't impress Jesus very much. 
She gave a little bit, and he was very impressed. She gave sacrificially. She gave from the heart. She gave because she loved God. She gave, and God didn't look at what she gave. He looked at how much she had left over after she gave. What was the percentage of her gift? See, Jesus judges and grades differently. Sometimes people think, well, you know, I don't have a whole lot to give. I don't even know if it would make a big difference. I don't know that it would matter. It is not about the size of your gift. You're not going to impress God who is bigger than the universe. There's nothing that you're going to do that is going to say, well, well to God, well, well, God, you know, I know you really need this. is a whole lot of money here. There, there's, you cannot give a lot of money. to God. God owns it all. I mean, what, what are we talking about here? Jesus is looking at your heart. He's looking at your attitude. He's looking at the, the, the sacrifice that you make that demonstrates how much he means to you. She gave it all. So when you give, you ought to feel it a little bit, shouldn't you? Or a lot. You ought to give sacrificially. As King David said, I will not offer to God something that costs me nothing. You don't give God your junk, your leftovers. You give God the first. You give him the best because he's worthy and he's worth it. So you give in Jesus' name and you give sacrificially. And then here's another thing that you need to <clears throat> consider <clears throat> and know because this is very important. When you give, you give as a steward. Uh, here's something Jesus um, said in Luke 16. He who is faithful in a little thing is faithful also in much. And he who is unrighteous in a very little thing is unrighteous also in much. Therefore, if you have not been faithful in the use of unrighteous wealth, in other words, money in this life, who's going to entrust true riches to you? Money in the next life. If you've not been faithful in the use of that which is another's, who will give to you what is your own? That which is another's, what does he mean? Well, let's handle that in a second. No servant can serve two masters, for he's either going to hate the one and love the other, or else he'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and wealth. You've got to make up your money. Who do you serve? But Jesus says, if you've not been faithful in what is another's, who's going to give you that which is your own? God teaches us in the Bible that we are stewards. We have been entrusted and we are supposed to manage what has been given to us. Not as owners, but as those who are in charge of using what's been entrusted to us. And so as you look at what you have, understand that the Bible says in Psalm 24, that earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Everything belongs to God. You belong to God. 1 Corinthians said, you have been bought with a price. You are owned by God, which means everything that you have is owned by God. You are a manager of what God has entrusted to you. Deuteronomy chapter 8 says this, you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who is giving you the power to make wealth. You may think you're a self-made man or self-made woman, but you better understand something. You would not have the brain you have. You wouldn't have the opportunities that you've had. You would not have the success that you've had had God not sovereignly allowed all this into your life. God has given you what you have, and he's given it to you to manage for him. And on Judgment Day, you're going to be called to account for what you have done with his money, his time, his life that he has given you. You're a manager of it. Now I feel some, it gets a little cold in here when you start talking about this because some people say, well, I give 10%. Is 10% God's or is it all God's? See, you've got to wrestle with this in your mind. How much of it is mine and how much of it is his? Because if it's all his, then you're responsible for what you do with what's his. And if all you do is take what's his and consume it for yourself, on yourself, then you're missing the point of why God gave you what he gave you. Because he gave you that for you to use so that you would have something to invest that it might advance the kingdom of God and cause you to be rewarded on the other side with treasure in heaven. 
But if you're not going to be faithful with what he gives you here and now, he says, you know you're not going to be trusted with the stuff that's really good on the other side. You've got to manage and use what God has given you here the right way. And you may say, well, preacher, do you think we use it the wrong way? Well, let me ask you this. If you've got 50 pair of shoes in your closet, do you need 51 pair? I mean, how many pairs of shoes can you possibly wear? If the kingdom of God is advanced, somehow, some way, sometimes through giving, because missions takes money, should the money that you have be used for you or for missions? So you've got to wrestle with this. What, what am I going to do with what God has given me? Because I know I'm going to have to answer for it on that day. And see, God's not just made you a steward of money. He's made you a steward of your life. And so you may have 80 or 90 years to live while somebody else only has 30. What are you going to do with that extra 60 years that God's given you? How are you using it for his name and his kingdom? Uh, God has given you good health. Not everybody has good health. How are you going to use the health God has given you? If God has given you beauty, isn't it a shame to squander it? Should you take the life God has given you and cause it to be cut short by 20, 25, 30 years because you choose to smoke? Would you cause your children and grandchildren to watch you die of a cancer and to waste a huge amount of wealth on medical bills that could have been avoided? So you have to think through how it is that you're going to live and what you're going to do with what God has given you so that when you stand before him on judgment day, it's going to go well for you. God, I made choices in this life knowing this day was coming, judgment day. And I have planned and prepared. You, if you've got wealth, may have a financial advisor and someone that invests for you. How would you like to take the person that... Um, you give money to and entrust money to, you, you put that money in their hands and say, use this and grow it. And they take the money that you've entrusted them and instead of using it to grow and for your benefit, they spend it on themselves. God has given you his wealth to manage. You're going to be called on account for what you've done with what he's given you. So you give as a steward. God has given to you. He owns it all, and he owns you. It's all his. Now, there's an alternative to giving, and I think this is what a lot of people choose. L listen to what Jesus shared in Luke 12 as a, a parable, a story. It says, the land of a rich man was very productive. He began reasoning to himself, saying, what shall I do since I have no place to store my crops? Then he said, this is what I'm going to do. I'm going to tear down my barns and build bigger ones. I'm going to store all my grain and my goods, and I will say to my soul, soul, you have very many goods laid up for many years to come. Take your ease, eat, drink, be merry. God said to him, you fool. This very night your soul is required of you. Now who will own what you have prepared? So this is like the, this is the man that stores up treasure for himself and is not rich towards God. You fool. It's Jesus' words. I, if I could go back in time, let, let's say we could, um, let's imagine a certain scenario. Let's say we could go back to about the year 2000. You're an American citizen, but you live in Venezuela. Now, you may not know what's going over on in Venezuela like in the past 20 years, but socialism has come in. And their currency right now is basically worthless. Inflation has gone through the roof. You can't buy anything over there because there's nothing on the store shelves. They have ruined their country. So let's say you're back in time 20 years from now, but you're a pretty shrewd investment person. Your, your home is in America, but you're living in a foreign country. And you've got your wealth in their currency. But you can see what's coming, and you know that in a short amount of time, everything that you have stored up is going to be worth nothing. Do you think it would be wise to transfer your wealth to a currency in a place that is safe and secure, or do you think you ought to just leave it in Venezuelan currency and watch it go to nothing? 
See, if you've got a brain, you, you know what you're going to do. This isn't my home. I've got the ability to transfer what I have so that it will be safe and saved for me. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to get it out of where it is, put it where it needs to be, so we don't have to worry about a loss, and instead, there can be a profit. Are y'all thinking, or have I lost you? I don't know. You know what rich people usually do, though? They love money. They love stuff. You know any rich people? You know them building bigger barns? How many houses can you own? How much stuff do you need? They build more, 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 more. So be careful with that. So I've given you three things. Let me give you two more, then we're, then we're done. Rewards are based on your heart. They're based on your deeds. They're based on your giving. And I'll remind you that when you give, you give in Jesus' name, give sacrificially, but understand you are a steward, and whatever you have when you die, you lose it all. Some people may say that I'm going to leave some in my will. That's great. I think you should if you want to go that route, but understand that when you die, that you've, your opportunity to give is done. It doesn't take any faith whatsoever to give after you're gone. So think about that. You might want to give before you go, not after. Um, number four, where am I? What am I talking about here? Um, your motives. Matthew chapter 6, verse 4. The same place we started, Matthew 6. Here's what Jesus says in verse 3 and 4. When you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing so that your giving will be in secret. Your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Now, Jesus over and over again talks about this, not just with giving, but he talks about praying, with fasting. When you do things, you're not supposed to do them so that other people around you are going to say, oh, you're so wonderful, that was so great, you gave so much, what a good job you did. When you give, don't tell anybody what you've done. Don't give so that your name gets put on a building or a plaque or a wall. or uh, I mean, just give it knowing that God has seen what you've given. Don't do it to receive a reward of applause in this life. Look for the applause to come in the next life. Because if you're rewarded in this life for what you've done, then you won't get rewarded in the next life. You've got to make a choice of what you want. Do you want to get a reward here now? Or do you want it for later? Give it not so that you'll be seen. Give it so that it will be invisible. For God's eyes only. For his name and his glory, not for your own. Give it because you love Jesus. Give it because you believe it's the right thing to do. Number five, then we're done. The motive is, is, is God's eyes. That's what it's for. And then here's the last one. When you give, it's got to be a gift of faith. The Bible says, faith, if it has no works, is dead, being by itself. And the Bible says in Romans 14, whatever is not from faith is sin. And so if you don't believe that there's a God and you don't believe that he rewards and you don't believe that it matters that you give, how are you going to give by, in faith? But, but when you believe that there's something that God is happy with and that he's excited about, you giving to and he's uh, someone that you love and you care about, you love Jesus and you're thankful for Jesus and you appreciate Jesus and you want Jesus to see what you've done and you don't care that anybody else knows and you want to give from the heart and work from the heart and serve from the heart, then you're acting in faith. Uh, what, do you know the Bible says without faith it's impossible to please God? And so let me just take what I just said here and I'm going to build on it because I gave you the title of the message which is Faith Finances in the Future. And let me tell you how that works itself out maybe in our context. I'm going to read to you a story, and this is the last thing, and then we're done. This comes from the life of Moses and uh, the people of Israel. Um, it comes from the book of Exodus, and here's something that happened. The Bible says that Moses spoke to all the congregation of the sons of Israel, saying, This is the thing which the Lord commands, say, saying, Take from among you a contribution to the Lord. Whoever is of a willing heart... Let him bring the Lord's contribution, gold, silver, and bronze. Uh, the Bible then goes on and says, Then all the congregation of the sons of Israel departed from Moses' presence, everyone whose heart stirred him. 
And everyone whose spirit moved him came and brought the Lord's contribution from the work of the tent of meeting and all its service and for all the holy garments. Then all whose hearts moved them, both men and women, came and brought brooches and earrings and signet rings and bracelets and articles of gold. So did every man who presented an offering of gold to the Lord. Now, listen to what I'm about to tell you. The people that are bringing this offering are bringing it because Moses said, there's a God who wants us to build a place where we're going to meet with him. God's going to tabernacle among us. And God's got a plan for the future. And he told them, not that they had to give, but if you believe God's in this and you want to be a part of what God's doing, you give to it. Now, the people that are giving just months before had been enslaved in Egypt. Their entire life, they had nothing. They were property that was owned by somebody else. But God set them free. It came after the blood of the lamb was spilt, and they put the blood on the door of the uh, the house. They put it here, and they put it on the either side. And when the death angel passed over and they, they saw the blood, the Firstborn in Egypt died, but nobody in Israel died because the blood had been applied and they were safe. And then God used that to allow them to be freed. And so these people who had nothing, as they walked out, asked the Egyptians for articles of of wealth. And they gave it to them. They just get out, take it and go. That's what they wanted them gone. Ten plagues God had sent, the last one, the death angel, and then after that, get out. We don't want you or your God anymore. So they left, and they finally, for the first time in their existence, not only had freedom and life, but they had wealth. And instead of hoarding that wealth and keeping it for themselves, Moses said, anybody that wants to can give to the future and invest in it. And they came and they gave. You think everybody gave? Maybe not everybody. But the ones that believed, the ones whose heart stirred, they gave. And here's how it ended up. The Bible says this, Moses issued a command and a proclamation was circulated throughout the camp saying, let no man or woman any longer perform the work of the contribution of the sanctuary. Thus the people were uh, restrained from bringing any more for the material they had was sufficient and more than enough for the work to perform it. How many times have you ever known a preacher say, hey, y'all stop giving, we got enough? (laughs) You say, well, that would be a miracle in itself. Yeah, it would, preacher. Here's what I found out. When people believe that God wants them to give, and they believe that there's something God's doing, they'll give to it. The evidence that the people have bought in is when their pocketbooks are freed and their heart is released and the money's there. And so if there's something that God wants to happen, how is God going to do it? He's going to do it through the... I think sometimes churches sit back and they think, you know, I bet there's some one rich person out there that's going to give a big pile of money. I don't find that's usually the way it is. Usually rich people, they, they build their bigger barns. If the money was going to be given, it would have already been given. You know who it usually is? It's the people that give little bits here and there, and it all adds up to something big. But if you want to see something happen, faith without works is dead. If you believe God wants something built, you'll give to it. And if you don't believe it, then you won't give to it. Right? So here's, let, let me put it another way. You might have 500 people walk through the doors of this church this morning. Um, Maybe another 100 that couldn't be here for some reason, another sick, traveling, whatever. If the average wealth of of each person, adult here, is about $50,000, and you may say, well, Pastor, I don't have anything. Yeah, you don't, but somebody else might have 100, might have 200. I I bet it probably would average out about that with the age in here and the amount of wealth that's been saved up over a lifetime of earning from houses and everything else, I'm probably cutting it a little bit short. 500 people, $50,000 a head, that's $25 million. Most people, if they lost 10% of it, probably wouldn't miss anything. That's $2.5 million. If people really believed that God wanted to build something, you'd have it, wouldn't you? 
So if you don't have the money, then God must not be ready for you to give yet, or either you think that you want to keep the money because it's yours. It's one of the two, right? So we're stewards of what God's given us. If God works in your heart to give, then we might can have something else here. And if you don't want to give and you want to hold on to it, then you won't have it. Am I clear enough? I see some of your heads are spinning. A lot of people keep talking about, man, we need another building. We need another building. Maybe we do, maybe we don't. The big question is not whether or not we want it. The question is whether God wants it. If you believe God wants it, then you'll give to it. If you want it for you, you won't give to it. But if you think God wants it, then you'll give. So I'm trying to tell you how to have treasure in heaven. I'm trying to tell you how to give in such a way that there will be something for you on the other side. But it all starts with a relationship with Jesus. You've got to know him first, and then once you know him, then start laying up for yourself treasure in heaven. If you don't know him, I invite you to meet him today. And if you know him, use the time and the wealth God has given you wisely. Let's pray. Father.